that shit. Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Smile on my face, behind my back, and talk trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. Yeah. I don't want to hear it. Brought to you live and unfiltered. Fucking punk. From all four corners of the globe. That's what you said. By MMA aficionado Antoine Pelchay. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and today I have a very special guest, Ree Webster, the matchmaker from Full Metal Dojo, and Ree, we, <laughs> and Ree, pardon me, you have a, uh, you guys have a big card coming up on the 22nd, and I know you're instrumental to this organization. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, I'm well, thank you, Antoine. Hello, people out there. Thanks for your time. So yeah, next show, August 22nd, so a week on Saturday, mate, and it's all going off at this end. Okay, excellent. So I had John on the show the other day. We kind of broke the news of the event coming out. I mean, it come. he think he broke the news a couple of days before, but one of the really cool processes that we're going to do uh, right here, right now, is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the employees and the people that make up Full Metal Dojo and also your uh, various roles within there and primarily your role as a, as a matchmaker within the organization. Cool, cool. So obviously John's the founder, the CEO, uh, and the all-around uh, multi-hat wearing uh, crazy dude yes. running around doing a gazillion things. And he's really the face of the organization. But, uh, you know, talking with him, it sounds like you play a really significant role in Full Metal Dojo as well. Have you have you been involved with every single one of the FMDs? Yeah, so basically what happened was, I mean, anybody who knows John will know he's the man with the vision. He's the man, you know, with these crazy ideas and really, really wants to push MMA and combat sports throughout Asia. So there was a previous organization, which I'm sure people would be aware of, the DARE MMA, and we were actually all kind of part of that. John was a major part of it. I helped out with a bit of the social media, a bit of their PR and stuff. And as they sort of, hmm, how do you say this, as they sort of took a back seat on the events they were putting on, we decided to keep things going. So I've been uh, instrumental from the very beginning of Full Metal Dojo. And uh, all of us who are part of it now are actually had a background working with the Dare MMA guys before. So uh, we've all been doing MMA here in Bangkok for Oh, a long time now, man. We're going on probably six years or something. Okay. okay. With FMD, FMD founded about a year and a half ago. So uh, that's the basic background of how we all got started. Okay. Now, are you a practitioner of martial arts yourself? Actually, I'm not. I mean, I do train now, but I train now basically to get an idea of what these guys go through. Yeah, um, it's, it's, I, it's funny you mentioned that. It's sort of what I... Uh, why I got into training a little bit of Muay Thai and MMA as well was to just, I'm just a super fan of the sport and um, to just, you know, it's easy to sit on your couch there and watch these guys beat the snot out of each other, but. An armchair fan and you, you're picking people's games apart and all of this. I, I didn't want to be just that guy, you know. So, uh, yeah, a fan of, of MMA for about 10, 15 years, yeah, 12 years, ever since I moved out here, man. So, um, and then, yeah, as we started working with the previous organization and founding FMD, it was pretty important for me to uh, get up and out there and get socked in the face a couple of times. Um, I probably won't be fighting professionally, <laughs> but I'm always up for training. I'm always up for uh, learning the ins and outs of the games, like for real, you know, not just watching a few clips on TV and thinking you know everything. So Totally. So... Obviously, we're going to talk about your role as the matchmaker within the company. But you know, we, we talked a little bit before and uh, before we hit record here, and um, you were explaining that there's really just three people running FMD. So, who besides you and John is involved, and how do you guys separate your roles within the organization? Okay, well, I'm sure you can imagine staff. It was a bit difficult to separate roles. The other guy that we have as a founding member, his name's Richard Arthur. He's known in Bangkok for writing a a traveler's book, a book about his tales of backpacking years and years ago. And uh, he's also a, a long fan of MMA and, you know, he's been into the sport ever since and was working with the previous organization. So it was us three who decided to get things rocking under the Full Metal Dojo brand. And between us three, I mean, we employ people. We hire people to help us out. 
but it really is just us three. And we've got Richard basically dealing with the business side of things, hitting up the sponsors and, you know, doing all the the organizational work, all the schedules, all the logistics, all that kind of stuff. Um, I personally, myself, come from an event background. I've been a music producer, I've been in bands, a DJ, all of that kind of stuff. So um, I tend to take care of a lot of the event planning as well. <clears throat> and then John is obviously, as we spoke before, he's just the man with the vision, the man who gets out there, meets the people, and, and you know, he puts his ideas out there. We figure out whether they're going to be good for the people, and then we put them into practice. So under John, there's me and Rich trying to get things rocking, and jobs sort of, you know, change between events. Sometimes one person's taking care of this, sometimes another person's taking care of that. Um, but I would say that if you had to just put a, a title on our job, job descriptions, Richard is the business guy, and I am the event organizer and matchmaker in the simplest terms. All right, very cool. Um, you know, and just seeing how, you know, talking with John and seeing his passion that he, he puts into this promotion, it really sounds like, you know, that this is kind of like a mom and pop operation and it really comes down to a, a labor of love. And I'm sure the three of you really have, must have to have a lot in common and really align yourselves with John's vision to pull these things off. And I can imagine the amount of work is just horrifying. You know? Yeah, I guess that's what kind of came naturally because the work is horrifying. The amount that we have put on our plate is, is ridiculous. And anyone who kind of has worked with us will know that. We're pretty open book when it comes to, you know, the things, how we organize things and who we involve. So, um, yeah, it's the fact that we do share John's vision and the things that he say we are fully, like, on board with most of the time. So it, it is that labor of love, that passion that just sort of everybody shares, which makes the abundance of work not too much of a nightmare to deal with, if that right. makes any sense. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, absolutely it does. I mean, you know, when you look at these big scale, you know, productions, you can only, I mean, you know, if you just look at something like a UFC or a Bellator or a, even a 1FC, I mean, you, you look at the scale and you imagine the moving parts, but you also imagine, you know, there, there's an incredible amount of staff behind all that. And, uh, you know, I know that I know yeah. that you guys just really get your hands dirty, right? <laughs> like, you know, you guys like make and break this thing. Yeah, we like to be involved in everything. I mean, there, there isn't really a decision that happens in the company that doesn't come through us all together. You know, we're not out there just making decisions on our own. It, it is a real joint thing. With John, obviously, calling the shots. I mean, he's the man who's been in the game the longest. He's the one with the respect, and he really knows the fighters out here in Southeast Asia, you know, more than more than bookies, more than fans, more more than people who train with somebody, because John's at every gym. He's not just training with the same people every day, you know. So um Yeah. Yeah, it kinda yeah. it kinda goes like that. Very cool. Then look, man, let's not let's not uh, hesitate any further. Let's uh let's announce this full fight card and let's step through each match and let people know Let's let's hear your process. You know, let's step through um, let's step through your fighters, see why you pick them, why you put them together, and what you're expecting from these matchups. Cool. All right. So I'm, I'm going to shoot in no particular order, <clears throat> um, and I'm, I'm going to start off with I don't know if we're even going to call this our headline bout, but it's certainly one of our most prominent. We got two Thai guys. They're widely known as some of the best MMA guys in Thailand. They both fought for us a couple of times, as well as fighting many times in the other lower-level amateur organizations throughout Thailand. And uh, we're basically, we're going to hold a, a bantamweight championship with this bout. So we're actually going to award one of them, the, the bantamweight champion of FMD. And uh, with John's crazy vision, we're not handing out belts or medals. We're giving them a katana. We're giving them a sword. <laughs> yeah, he announced <laughs> so, that on the podcast we did. I think it's an awesome idea, man. There we go. That's John for you. So these guys are the first guys, uh, Dechidin Petsinkorn, and I am not even going to pronounce that second name. Sorn <laughs> Sivi Patanin, something like that. The guys out there, everyone will know him as Dechidin Petsinkorn. Okay. Now he's a Muay Thai practitioner who's moved into MMA, um, and he will be fighting a guy called Kritsadar Krongsi Chai, otherwise known as Dream Man. Um, Dream Man's on the Thai nas national wrestling team, based in Chumpon. 
He's actually doing his um, his fight camp up here in Bangkok for this next show. So um, Dechidin's holding a record of two and two as a pro and four and one as an amateur with a 20 and three record in Muay Thai. He's been, yeah, 12 years training Muay Thai art. And he actually trains under, I believe he's the only guy with the original Muay Thai art bloodline who's still alive. And that is Master Crew Preng. And they train up in a town in town up in Bangkok. That's so, very cool. Uh, yeah, we actually got an interview and some footage of them doing like uh, the knife fighting and the stick fighting and doing those crazy death moves that they were saying were used in Ayutthaya when the Burmese came and all of that stuff. So uh, there should be interesting footage coming out on his background in the not too distant future. And then uh, his opponent, Chris Siddhar, Dream Man, this little guy can suplex any mother. Seriously. He took a fight through as a, against a guy who was like a, a weight class above, a guy from Cambodia. The guy's been cutting weight. So when the guy stepped in the ring, he was pretty big. The, the size differential was obvious. Dream Man was throwing him around like he weighed a few pounds, man. It was absolutely crazy. So he's holding uh, an MMA pro record of three and two and an amateur record of six and one. Um, and then basically he just competes in uh, the national wrestling competitions for, for Thailand. So um, these are two guys we've had in a lot of events. A lot of, they've got a big fan following for themselves. And uh, yeah, we're looking to push them because uh, they, they really do have the talents that have translated over to MMA pretty well. So, so why, um, did you choose, why did you choose these two guys and to make this FMD's first championship fight? is a really good question you know so these two guys are basically some of the only two guys that have racked up a, a relatively good uh, amateur career I mean a, a lot of guys have fought and and it just doesn't get taken down it doesn't get noted it doesn't go on their record these guys have been slightly different and they've always competed in, in organizations that have given them not necessarily a sure dog but a, a, an actual record that, that stays behind them something you can research and, you know, find out about. Um, sorry about that. I've got loads of messages coming through. We'll just have to... <laughs> no worries, man. <laughs> um, so, yeah, basically, they're just widely regarded as some of the best MMA guys. Now, there's a couple more, so I, I don't want to say they are the best. But in that weight division, we have two more guys who are also on the card. They just don't quite have the amount of fights. So we're sort of prepping the bands and weight. We have a, we have a lineup of, of, of guys that are deserving of getting a title shot. And these two guys are just there, right at the top. Um, so main reason we picked them, I mean, it's a classic Muay Thai versus wrestler matchup. Um, and as soon as we announced this match between the ties, everyone was really shocked that this has never happened before. I mean, it's a matchup that is, on paper, it's surprising that people haven't tried to do this. So um, everyone's really excited about it. It just comes down to these guys having the experience, having the following. They've been at our events. They've got the most experience. Excellent. Sounds like uh, it sounds like it's going to be a barn burner, man. <laughs> you know, and it's always interesting. It was... uh, it's always interesting to see how a tie being involved with wrestling and that he's part of the Thai national wrestling team. I, I don't mean, I don't know how good they are, but the fact that he's exactly. dedicated, the fact that he's dedicated to that is going to be interesting to see how that converts into him, you know, bring it into I, MMA. Yeah. Exactly. We actually, we're trying to get their, their, their coach. <clears throat> we're trying to get him for an interview as well, because, uh, you know, we'd like to hear as a mentor, what he thinks about all this and how he assists them. We just haven't quite caught up with him yet. So uh, as we do, we'll let you know and we'll fill you in on any other useful information we might find. Excellent. So then next up, I'm looking here, you got a middleweight matchup between Ibrahim Aid and Nikolai Kozarev. That's correct. So Ibrahim is a guy who's not actually based in Thailand. He's been in contact with us for the last year or something, looking for a fight. And uh, he trains out of New York, which anybody who's a fan of MMA will know. They don't have pro fights out there. No, they so, don't. <laughs> I'm sure he's one of these guys who's hitting up every organization in every country just to, just to try and get real fights, you know? So he trains out of elite MMA in New York. Um, and now I have here on my notes, <laughs> he's a national boxing and judo champion. So 
He's from Egypt, so I imagine he's a national boxing and judo, judo champion in Egypt in his respective weight class. So he's okay. fighting a different weight. And then his opponent, Nikolai, is fighting out of AKA, which I'm sure everyone knows by now have opened up a proper high-tech facility down there in Phuket and have some of the best MMA fighters in and out of there, you know. Uh, yeah, I've had, a, I've had just a ton of them on my show. You know the yes, exactly, the Glenn Sparves yeah. and the and the Mike Swicks exactly. and of course they've had uh, you know they had So Palele in there yes. Mark Hunt has just been a gang of down there exactly and the the guy down there um, Marcio Caesar the the Jiu Jitsu guy yep. the Jiu Jitsu guy I mean he's an absolute killer he's another guy that we're really looking to to match up and that's something we'll talk about later when we when we get into how we do these matchmaking um pro how we get the matchmaking process going. So now, what's anyway. interesting I'm seeing from the numbers here is that Ibrahim is 0-2 in his pro MMA history and Nikola so, Kozarev is actually 0-0, so he's making his debut here. Debuts. Now, they've both got quite a lot of combat sports experience. Nikolai is 8-2 professional Muay Thai, so getting in the ring to compete is, uh, is no funny feeling to that chap. And... Um, He's a big part of the AKA team down there, so you know he gets put through his paces every single day. Yep. Um, now, Abraham, I actually have some notes on Abraham on his, two, his previous competition experience. So let me just pull that up, because I know he's, he's actually quite well experienced. So... Uh, now, what's so interesting, get, too, is I've seen that you have, uh, you know, AKA Thailand is actually sponsoring this event as well. So they have fighters yes, in it, they're that, sponsoring. What, uh, what sort of advantage do you guys gain from having, uh, you know, a reputed... Well, actually, uh, we, we try to keep sponsorships from gyms completely separate to any matchmaking we do. Of so course. You'll see by any sort of numbers and on paper, things are never in their favor. They are basically, they will have a booth at the event and they will be basically advertising their fitness programs, training programs, all of that kind of stuff. They will also be giving away a couple of free training programs. I'm not sure of the full details, whether they'll include accommodation and all of that, but they'll, uh, they'll be giving away some prizes on the day as well. So <clears throat> we're actually really looking to get as many gym sponsorships as possible, just because, you know, these are the people that want to help push the sport. And it's amazing how much a small amount of cash, help, product, whatever it may be, how far it can go, you know. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's been Francisco and Mike and, and Blair and Adrian and the guys over um, AKA have been absolute pleasure to work with and um, we'd love to get their guys some uh, decent fights. But as I said, <laughs> it doesn't give them any favors when it comes to the matchmaking. We make sure that things are done properly on paper and there's you know favor doesn't swing in anyone's direction well and listen i mean it's the ak brand it's not like these guys made their reputation fighting cans right like yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know they've fought nothing but the best their whole career so i mean something we'll, we'll discuss when we get to the match rating thing too because it's, it's quite shocking some of the uh conversations that take place so to speak so anyway here's here's abraham's Here's Abraham's fight history. So, yeah, Egyptian national judo champ, under 16, under 19, seniors third place, senior second place, senior first place, open judo, um, the Arab judo, junior and senior, all first place, and open boxing championships, first and second place through 2008 to 2010, all in Egypt. So, um, he's... Definitely no stranger to competition, and uh, both of these guys accepted the fight with barely any questions whatsoever. Oh, this guy, sure, I'll take that fight. Good. And, um, that's, yeah. that's what you that, want to see, right? Of, that's what we want to see, because we don't just put two names together. You know, we, we go through the paces, we check out whatever tape we have on the guys, we, we do what digging we can, so we try not to just offer fights out there for the hell of it, you know? So it's, it's nice when somebody agrees easily you know we've done our homework and i'm sure they're doing theirs as well and it, it just makes the world go around a bit easier <laughs> excellent all right what do we got next next we've got um a young guy out of the fairtex camp in patia <clears throat> he goes by the name of yod bung jong fairtex and he'll be fighting a guy called cham long charem they're both ties 
Phantom Weight Belt. Um, now, the Fairtex guy, he has had, um, had 90 Muay Thai fights with a record of 60 wins, 20 losses, and 10 draws. He's had a uh, one pro MMA fight, which he lost. So he's an 0-1 as a pro. Um, and then Chamlong Charum, he has an amateur record of 2-2 two and, two and a pro record of 1-0. and oh. <clears throat> Now, he fights out at Shingi Dojo in Bangkok, which is run by Kenji Akiyama, um, <clears throat> cool guy who has a lot of fight experience himself. Um, his gym is just up there, I... Uh, Prakanong BTS. So if anybody feels like dropping down there, they do a lot of uh, traditional jiu-jitsu, karate, judo, taekwondo, you know, very uh, Japanese orientated martial arts, but they obviously dabble in MMA as well. So <clears throat> let's see. The Fairtex guy, a bit of interesting trivia. The fight that the pro fight that he lost was by a, an illegal knee. And he was disqualified for. Okay. <laughs> the Fairtex guy that fought for us in FMD5 also got disqualified for an illegal, yeah. an illegal, illegal knee. That was right so at the start right. of the fight, right? I mean, I saw that that's, highlight reel. That's right. That's right. So both of these guys uh, seem to like the sneaky knees when they're not allowed. So I wonder if that's something to be watching out for. To be fair, those previous bouts were um, not pride rules, not the global rules. So okay. we will actually be having this fight, uh, you know, knees to the head of a downed opponent are allowed, all of that stuff. So there shouldn't be any disqualifications. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Cham Long, he, we organized the fight for him on the MMA, on the MMR, on the cruise ship thing that the Chun yeah. Talk and Mima people did. <clears throat> and he fought Alan Solomon Chong, the winner of the Tough House, one of the, uh, you know, uh, Malaysia Borneo's top guys. Good. He was actually losing for three rounds on the floor. Managed to get up, got a rib shot, got a head kick, and and won the fight. <clears throat> so that's where his own one comes from. It's actually against a, a guy who's thought of as a bit of a veteran in the uh, MMA scene. So that looks to be an explosive bout. They're both from Muay Thai backgrounds, but they've both got experience in MMA. Are these guys being groomed in any fashion to perhaps take on the winner or the loser of the title fight? <laughs> you got it. There you go. It's simply because they don't have the amount of fights that we didn't put them up first. Okay. But these are some of the guys that are indeed, yeah, we're keeping our eye on, trying to give them the best fights we can. Be nice to see them progress to the top in the future. Great. Excellent. Next up, I see we have a catch weight boat at 68 kilos. Oh, wow. This is going to be another hell of an explosive fight. This one will be. So, <clears throat> first up, we've got a guy called Vera Yut Yutapan. He goes by the name of Yut. His fight name is Hanuman. <clears throat> He'll be facing a guy. Uh, he, he trains out of Raw Team in Bangkok. He'll be uh, fighting a guy called Terra Yut, very similar names, Terra Yut Karawa, or something like that, terrible with Thai pronunciation. He goes by the name of Top, and he fights under the name of Saxarin, Tiger Muay Thai. Now, <clears throat> both of these guys have added to the hundreds of Muay Thai fights. Um, I don't have Yut's um, official record, but Top's record is 240 wins. 98 losses and two draws. It's just insane. That, that it's just insane. insane. It'll, it'll, never, it'll never sink in how these guys can do this, man. Like, how are you not just demolished from head to feet after being beaten 98 times? It's ridiculous, <laughs> like, isn't it? You know? Now, he's actually... He holds a belt from Ratchadam Mun, which is obviously one of the prominent uh, prominent stadiums in Bangkok these days. And he's also the Omnoi champion as well. So um, Tiger Muay Thai guys are proper training him on the on the ground. His uh, I haven't seen, but apparently his ground game is coming along nicely, and they are not afraid to show it. So hopefully we'll see these guys actually take it to the ground because he upped. He fought for us in FMD4, and he won by um, by guilty. Very so cool. he's also, yeah, he's no stranger to the ground game as well. The Raw team in Bangkok are quite well known for their Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So, um, as, again, I don't know how many fights Yurt's had, but I'm under the impression it's into the hundreds. So, um, yeah, that's going to be one hell of a killer fight. 
Excellent. Now, why is it a catch weight? It's a catch weight simply because it didn't quite get confirmed in the time frame we'd like to do things. And the ties are not necessarily, <clears throat> they're not weight cutters. You know, it's not like an American wrestler who's been cutting weight ever yep. since his senior year or something, you know. So um, weight cutting for them is a new thing. And these, these two guys are all about it. You know, they know that's what it requires, a, at least a healthy weight cut. Um, and he just didn't have time. So instead of, you know, be, you know, keeping it secret and turning up and standing on the scales and going, oh, look at me. He informed us that he didn't think he'd be able to get down, and we obviously contacted Tiger Muay Thai, and they were happy with the catch weight at 68, so we made it at 68. Do you know who's going to be in top's corner from uh, from Tiger Muay Thai? I do. Uh, George Hickman, okay. who will actually be holding a wrestling seminar for us on the Thursday before the event. Excellent. The wrestling seminar will be at the Pick Hotel on the Soy 15, and it will start about 6 o'clock. Um, so... He will be in his corner, as well as Alex Shield, who has um, he's fought for us a couple of times before. A bit of a standout, happy guy down at um, Tiger Muay Thai. He's got his own um, his own brand of geese that are called Sabai Gi. Yeah, and, yeah um, I know Alex. <laughs> yeah, you know Alex. I'm not sure what belt he holds, but I know he's a pretty damn good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner as well. So um, the Tiger guys will be up here for the show. Now, I do know that Roger's got a fight coming up, so whilst he does usually come up and uh, enjoy the cele- uh, the enjoy the event, I don't think he will be this time. So, yeah, because I guess yeah. he's got a fight, is it in September, I think, right? Yeah, That's so right. So I think it'll busy. be George and Alex up in um, up in Top's Corner for the Tiger Muay Thai kids. All right, so, man, say hi to them for me. <laughs> I will do, I will do. All right, next up, welterweight matchup. Jan Steinbacher versus Mir el Okay, so Jan's got a rather interesting story. We have heard of him because he trained over at uh, Bali Muay Thai and MMA with the Leone brothers. Yep. Uh, so that's where the connection came from because he's actually from Germany and lives in Germany. And he was a banker. He's currently writing a book and having a documentary filmed about him, um, about from banking to fighting or something like that. Basically a story from transitioning to being an office worker, pushing pens, tapping keyboards to um, getting in the cage and uh, fighting basically. Yeah, it reminds so me a little bit uh, reminds me a little bit about Brad Robinson. There you go. It's yeah. a very similar story. Yeah, shout outs to Brad. What a what a cool chap. So Yeah, um, I met uh, I met Brad in uh, in Singapore um, and went by, doing, went, to, went to went to Darren De Silva's gym and interviewed both of them and I, I still need to put out that podcast. I've just had so many time sensitive episodes I needed to put out where guys had fights lined up, you know, so it makes sense to get the to get the to get podcast out before and I've kept pushing back uh, Brad's, but oh, you'll see when it drops. It's absolutely awesome. Well, Brad, Brad's got a good following in Singapore. He's doing great things with rituals, so um yeah, be interested to see that drop when it does, mate. So um yeah, anyway, so Yam's had a He's 3-0 and as an amateur, and this will be his pro debut. And, um, yeah, he got in contact, just really wanted to fight through us, wanted to put an end to his book, basically. You know, this will be the final chapter in his book. So uh, we've been looking for a suitable opponent. This one's been a bit of a nightmare, to be honest, mate. There's been fighters dropped, like, fighters up for it, dropped out, injuries, decided they didn't want to do it for whatever reason. He's probably had three different opponents so far. <laughs> But now we finally got it confirmed against a guy called Amir El Gohari. He's also Egyptian. It's the first time we've had Egyptian guys on the card, and we've got two of them. Yeah, it's funny. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's strange. Now, he's he's basically 6-0, and oh, but it's one of these situations where... 6-0 and oh is an amateur, but it's one of these situations where the, the first four amateur fights were like, you know, pads and, and amateur rules, and then the second two fights were pretty much pro rules, but... And it was never put down on typology or sure doc. So <clears throat> you could kind of call him 4-0 four, four as an amateur and 2-0 and as a pro, but officially on paper it's basically just 6-0 and o as an amateur. Yep. Um, now he's uh, also a gold medal winner uh, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Open, I believe. He's also in Egypt. I believe it was a welterweight class that he took that. And he's currently in Bangkok, training out of the Bangkok Fight Lab, which we all know and love. Moved to the training ground on um, Soy 69 right there. And also Sat Sip 
Frappa Muay Thai. I can never pronounce that. So um, we don't really know too much about these guys. But we've got training footage of them, that kind of stuff. We don't have much fight footage of them. So this one's one of those where we've had to really dig down to see what's there on paper, try and pick out little techniques, little tendencies they have in the videos that they're sending us. But, um, yeah, this is one of those that becomes a bit difficult to make because they don't just have fights on YouTube. and We've never seen any of their previous fights in person. So, um, oh, there you yeah. go. I mean, that's sort of the box. Life is a box of chocolate fights, right? <laughs> you just exactly. will see what happens. And this is one of those that, you know, we try not to do this as much as possible, but on the level we're kind of working with, it's very similar for a lot of guys. They've had fights, there's no footage of them whatsoever, and all they can really do is whip up some shadow boxing or some sparring or something, and shoot us some low-quality videos that we at least just get to see their style or what they're like. And, uh, yeah, we have to dig around and ask people if they know them and what they know of them and all that kind of stuff. So that's one of those that got paid in, in that kind of fashion as opposed to sitting watching tape. Yeah, one of those word-of-mouth fights. You know. Exactly, exactly. Very cool. Next up, we got a strawweight fight. And yeah, and so this is Pongsiri Piak Matisti. Again, Mitsatit. Thai name There we go. Pongsiri Mitsatit. Um, and uh, versus a guy called Wisava Kewa. Kawi Warakorn. Yeah, yeah, really yeah there we go. Kawi Warakorn. Search your dog afterwards and find out what they're really for. Cool. So, yeah, basically, Pong Siri versus Wisava. This will be a straw weight bout. They're both quite well known on the local Thai MMA circuit, but Pong Siri is also known as Piak, his Thai nickname, Smiling Assassin. He's breaking out there a bit. He gets a lot of, um, gets a lot of press about him. I mean, he's a young guy with a pretty cool background you know he came from nothing he, he found a gym and he's an absolute killer but you would not think it to look at him he's a small happy-go-lucky kind of shy kid when he steps in in the cage oh all hell breaks loose so um this is one guy that excuse me drink of this horrible schweppes manau lemonade stuff um repeating on me um so this is one guy that we'd really Really pushing to be getting out as a champion, but the straw weight division is really thin, which is quite surprising considering that a lot of Thai guys aren't too bulky. But yeah, yeah I mean, not... a lot of them must fit into that weight class quite handily, right? Yeah, you'd think so. We get a lot of bantam weights and a lot of fly weights, not so many straw weights. But um, as, as the name gets out there, as the kids start knowing about it, I'm sure we'll find more. So, um, basically, a lot of the time, Ponsiri steps in against people that he's, he's, he's quite, he's got a lot better skills than they have a lot of the time. This time, however, as with of our kids, uh, four and two as an amateur, again, it's these full pro rules, but it's not written down anywhere. It's not on sure dog. It's not, it's not officially a pro about, but it basically was. And I do believe he's just had another fight. That he won, so that could now be five and two. Okay. But um, Ponsiri isn't four and zero now. Um, he's over at Team Quest in Chiang Mai, and um, as I said, he's got quite a lot of press about him. So um, if anybody wants to find out about him, I'm sure they can follow the links within your article and uh, do the digging and, and, and see see where the kid came from because um, interesting story and a great fighter. Uh, so with Savar is at maximum Phuket most of the time. But he's actually up in Bangkok doing this fight camp at the Majima team over in Tamasat University. Okay. So, yeah, both of these guys, as I said, well known on the local Thai scene. We've seen them both fight a few times. Piak has fought for us numerous times. So, we're really looking forward to this one, too. Good, good. And now we have yet another bantamweight fight Luke Milano versus Jack Dan Tongyan. That's right. So Luke Milano is goes under the fight name of the Hagler, and he's over at Legacy Gym up in Ubon Ratchatani with Ole Larson and yep. the Killers up there. Another fantastic gym that are doing great things and in a nice peaceful setting, unlike some of the gyms elsewhere in Thailand. So uh, 
yeah, we love to get Legacy on the gym, or uh, Legacy Gym on the card, and this time it was Luke. So Luke's, he's got a bit of a losing record, but the kid's really tough, man. So he, he's, he's on three as pro Muay Thai, and he's one and two as a, an amateur MMA fighter. But uh, he's been really hon honing his skills. And obviously, you know, with Ole Larson and those guys, you know he's getting good training on that. Absolutely. So yeah. He'll be fighting Jack Tan. Now, Jack Tan, again, also very well known on the Thai MMA scene. He actually referees for Cage Wars or War in the Cage. I get those two mixed up. They're basically the same people. So, um, yeah, he referees for them. So he knows the game pretty damn well as a fighter, as a spectator, and as a referee. So um, it's the first time we've had him fight for us. He has a black belt in traditional jiu-jitsu. So um, we'll see how that translates into his MMA game. Um, he's holding a pro, a pro record of 0-2. Again, just fights in Thailand. He's not, you know, been out there in, in the international scene. And Luke, is. this will be his pro debut, basically. So okay. another rather evenly matched fight that we are proud to put on. We've known Jack Tan for a while, and we obviously love anybody coming out of Legacy Gym. They're always hard son of a guns. Sounds like a slobber knocker, man. <laughs> it does indeed. Couldn't have put it better myself. Perfect. Uh, next up, a featherweight matchup with Lin with two names that I'll let you pronounce again, since you're so good at it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's. Let's stick to the first names and we'll leave the second names, eh? <laughs> so exactly. we've got Tan Tanabadi, uh, also known as Ninja Man in the cage, against Tosawat, who's known as Doze. Um, so Ninja Man fights out of Karabi MMA, but recently he's just made the move to Maxim Maximum in Phuket. Yep. So unlike anybody we've had from Thailand before, he has a pro boxing record. Yeah, uh, I'm sure Traditional that. Western boxing. Yeah, so he's four and two as a boxer. He has a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He uh, fought for us before, and it was a real good fight, actually. He ended up losing, but it was real back and forth, real back and forth. It was by no means, you know, he didn't have the kick, uh, shit kicked out of him or anything like that. Um, so I've always promised him another fight because I don't think he, he was a bit gutted. He lost, you know, he really nearly took that fight. So and the same with Tossawat. Tossawat fought for us before, nearly nearly won, but ended up losing in the end. He trains out of a gym called Tan Tong, which probably isn't one of the biggest names out there, but it's a Bangkok-based gym, and they do churn out quite a few, uh, quite a few fighters that go over to Japan and win tournaments over there, and you know they they're well versed in the game. So even though they're not one of the biggest names, they they certainly know their stuff. So again, this is two guys that fought for us before. They both lost, so it just makes sense to stick them together and see who comes out victorious. One of those loser uh, loser leaves town matches. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> mate. But with the small amount of quality fighters we've got out there, we'll probably have them both back on again. I'm just, I'm like, just, I'm just being a sure. jerk. I, 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 I know that they always do those in big organizations, but uh, it that's, sets the tone. The it sets the tone that one person gets to move up in the ranks and the other one moves down, right? There you go, mate. There you go. So that's the one. Very cool. Then finally, a lightweight fight here. Scott Hudson versus Salim Mukadinov. Yeah, so Scott is another guy out of Team Quest. I believe he's Canadian. Okay. Um, even though on my notes it says he's American. I apologize to all Americans and Canadians for getting that mixed up. <laughs> he is Canadian. He is... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how long he's been based in Thailand, but um, he's got a four and two pro MMA record and a three or no amateur record, and he's also had one or two pro Muay Thai fights, which he won. Um, so he's quite experienced and quite a tough guy, and he'll be fighting Salim, who's O and O. So on paper, when it comes to MMA pros, it might look a little bit mismatched, but. Anybody who knows Salim, he fought over in Mima. Um, I mean, he's got a six and two amateur record, and also a nine and one combat sambo record. Yep. And he's out of AKA, so you know they're pushing the grind. This this guy's he's a talented fighter. 
So um, they both love that matchup. That was another one that sort of happened a little bit late. Scott had an original opponent that accepted a fight elsewhere, so we didn't want to keep promoting it, not knowing the outcome of that fight. Um, so we switched opponents, and Salim got the match, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to that one too. To be honest, that could be the most explosive fight on the card. I mean, you never know. It's hard to guess, but... Uh, Knowing Salim and knowing Scott, that, that should be that should be one heck of a brawl. Excellent. So as of right now, is this the final card? Is there anything more you're gonna add? Is there any you know, is there any it's the final card as of now? We were shooting for eleven fights. This is only nine. Okay. But uh, since we moved venues, we've been restricted with time. Like at the old venue it was totally up to us. Start whenever, finish whenever. But we're using Nightclub, Insanity yep. Nightclub yep. on Second Victory 12. They would like to open for the after party as they normally would have a party on a Saturday night. So we've got to be out of there by 11. So I think just to make the show run as smooth as possible, stress-free as possible, nine fights. We're keeping it like this. Excellent. So one fight fell through just a day or so ago. We had a MLO, Emilio Ursha. I can't yeah. pronounce his set. Emilio, uh, it's uh, Yerudia. I had him on my podcast as well. Emilio, Imalo Yeru- Yerudia. Yeah, we had him matched up too, but that that fell through. And instead of rushing around for an opponent last minute, we've promised him a fight on our October thirty first show. He has opportunity to fight in another organization in a couple of weeks. So you know yeah. he's not been training for nothing, so to speak. So yeah, we'll be keeping it like this. Um, it'll just make everything run smoother. And, uh, yeah, you know, matchmaking is a, is an all-day task, conversations, people beating around the bush with answers and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, that's out of the way now. Matchmaking starts for October the 31st, and we're pressing on getting everything ready for the event in a week on Saturday. Right on. Well, listen, man, I know you're super busy, and I'm not going to keep you a whole lot longer, but I know one thing that I do want to discuss with you before we go is – to discuss your actual matchmaking process, you know, and you and you hinted at that as we were going down this card of discussing the the challenges. And I know I've talked about this a lot with John on the podcast we've done together. And that you know, as a smaller organization, and even one that John considers a feeder organization, you know, you're dealing yeah. with guys with with low records, and at the same time, you're also trying to bring in people to these cards. So you, you you're tr- trying to juggle these, you know, these. These new rookie fighters, I mean, not necessarily rookies as in terms of martial artists, but in terms of MMA fighters, guys with exactly. somewhat limited records, you're dealing with limited budgets being the size of organization you are. Can you just touch on a bit of the challenges that you guys face to, to put together compelling, even matchups for your Full Metal Dojo yeah. cards? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is actually one of the most interesting parts about what we do, especially for us, behind the scenes, getting to see how it all fits together. But, um, you know, in an ideal world, we would like at least a, a main event with names that bring people in. And then we like a couple of feature fights, co-main, whatever you want to call them, with guys that are on their way to something. We have good relationships with uh, with One Championships and, and Mima and uh, occasionally Kun Lung contact us just to find the odd fighter, all of that jazz. So those co-main, those feature bouts, we're usually looking for guys like that, you know, who might immediately go on to a bigger fight after fighting for us. And I think we've already put five fighters through into bigger paying bouts outside of Thailand. And so that's our goal there. And then the, the rest of the card <clears throat> is basically, as you said, it's finding these guys that, kind of grooming in a way, giving them a record that means something, giving them an opponent that when somebody checks it out, it's like, all right, that guy was not a slouch. So, you know, <clears throat> that actually means something when you're saying you're four and oh, as opposed to, well, I'm four and oh, but all these guys, are, I was way overmatched. They weren't in my league sort of thing. So we just try and avoid that with the lower half of the card. But it's not an ideal world, and as you quite rightly mentioned, we have a strict budget for fight purses. So then it becomes who is willing to challenge a, a fair opponent for the fight purses that we're offering. 
which basically means we're looking for hungry guys, guys that aren't necessarily in it for the money, guys that want to build their record meaningfully. They get the share dog credits, they get all of that. So um, it can cause a little bit of drama when it comes to putting fights together, you know. Um, we'll offer somebody X amount of money and they'll throw back at us. We, I got offered $10,000 for that fight. It's just like, I, I don't know who you think we are, guys, but uh, that sort of entry-level UFC money. <laughs> we don't that's, have that. that's already uh it's sad to say but sometimes that's almost borderline established ufc money <laughs> you know sad to say but exactly true and i mean we, we by no means pride ourselves on our fight purses but we do pride ourselves on how we treat the fighters we understand what they have to go through yep. we understand the that sacrifice do, that's it and they do need paying so whilst we don't pay that much, we do as much as possible to make sure nothing's coming out of their, you know, we, we cover all their medical bills. We haven't had a medical bill we couldn't cover yet. You know, obviously some medical bills can go up into the hundreds of thousands and, and we do have a limit on our contract. But we have broken that limit numerous times just to get these bills paid for when you're not getting paid that much and then you have to spend it all on getting yourself fixed up in hospital can leave a sour taste in your mouth, all right? So <laughs> yep. we make sure we cover all of that so that at least they're walking away with a decent wad of money in their hand, a bit of recognition, and a record that could help them progress in the future onto organizations where they can get decent money. So in a nutshell, that's kind of our aim. When it gets down to it, mate, you know, drama, all of that nonsense can get in the way. <laughs> so, so what, uh, I mean, what to you would be the solution here to, I mean, obviously what's preventing you guys from making probably the big matchups that you really like to really just comes down to having that budget. Is there anything in the works that you guys are trying to accomplish to perhaps raise those budgets, raise those funds that allow yes. you to put on bigger fights, like more yes, rec recognized fights? We're actually currently in talks with a couple of MMA-related businesses that would like to see us put on some of these high-profile fights. And we're currently talking with them about sponsorships for that particular fight. You know, so this okay. fight is brought, yeah. brought to you by so-and-so. Now, the trick there is we, we don't want to be selling out. Whoever's sponsoring the fight needs to be related properly to MMA and... That is how we are currently trying to compile the rest of the cash to pay these the, the heavier weight guys with a bigger record or even the smaller weight guys that are just that one or two fights away from the UFC. But because we have a lot of smaller weight guys in Thailand, the main thing we're really looking for, mate, is some bigger guys with a decent name behind them because that is what we are lacking in Thailand, basically. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just, yeah, you look at the uh, at the average build in Thailand, and um, you know, they are definitely, you know, smaller builder dudes, exactly. slender guys, you know, and they, and it's just, you know, if you live out there like we have, um, you know, you just see that these guys are working out and sweating all day. They just, they don't have a, they don't have an ounce of fat on their bodies. And then it also affects people's decisions to come here and train before AKA opened. I mean, Tiger and I guess Phuket top team too, they, they have some big guys in there. But some of the other gyms, they just don't. So for people who are big in size deciding, oh, hey, I might do a, a, a camp in Thailand, their choices are really limited because they'll get there and they're like, might be kicking pads with someone that they're physically kicking over. <laughs> you know what I mean? The like, thing is, though, is, you know, if even if you look on a worldwide scale, I mean, if you look at what are probably the two thinnest divisions in the world, it's heavyweight it's, and light heavyweight. You know what I mean? Person. Finding these big guys who are good at this, there's not a lot of them out there. So, I mean, there's even going to be less in a place like Thailand, right? Exactly. And this is something we really have to give credit to AKA, Tiger Muay Thai, Phuket Top Team, and, and even Team Quest. They really do their best to make sure they do have big guys in there to hold pads. They do have big guys training their jiu-jitsu programs and all of that kind of stuff. Because, you know, they're not just here for the ties. They're here for the international scene. Yes. And um, yes. things are changing. I know Things are changing quite rapidly and quite progressively. There'll be a new gym unit, unit 26. Unit 27, 27. 27. Yep. Fernando Machero will be opening that up. And uh, yeah, these days, 
over the last year or so, uh, the, the big guys have, you know, as you were talking about Mark Hunt and so Pololi and all of these guys. So it is changing. And through the woodworks, we are seeing some big ties emerge as well. And not ties that are just overweight, but ties that are true lightweights and welterweights. And we've been in talks with them to get them on future bouts as well. So, uh, okay. yeah. Whilst this is a country generally with the smaller <laughs> fighting population, um, yeah, things are changing and we really do hope that we'll be here for that growth all the way as, as much as it'll go because it has the potential to, it already is, is the training capital of the world. So um, Now you mentioned, yeah, uh, you mentioned a Phuket top team and if memory serves me correctly, John said there was supposed to be a Phuket top team fighter on this card. Ah, oh, there we go. He was the guy who accepted a fight in Desert Force. Um, and with no hard feelings against that. They were paying much more money than we yeah, were. And okay. He hadn't signed a contract yet either. So gotcha. you know, if, if, if it had signed a contract, there might have been, oh, we're not harsh to people. There just might have been a, a few more talks. Yeah. But okay. he hadn't signed a contract. He let us know in advance. It, it wasn't a problem. And, uh, yeah, that was the guy who was going to fight Scott. So Scott had all those different gotcha. opponent challenges. So, um, yes, there was supposed to be a guy. It just fell through in the end. Okay. There will be in the future. So, um, Excellent. Well, Rhi, this was a really cool catching up, man. Um, do you have any shout-outs, any sponsors you'd like to put out there? Oh, man. The shout-outs could be endless, but I basically <laughs> should just put it down to the sponsors because they're the ones who make the show go around. So I'd just like to thank Fitway. <laughs> they have been Fitway. They have been there from the very beginning. Um, <clears throat> sponsored us since show one. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, they import... Um, and distribute <laughs> all training supplements, uh, you know, uh, whey protein, um, pre-workout, all of that kind of stuff. They have a website, so uh, anybody into that, please check it out. And Fairtex, who make our gloves, the FMD gloves, again, been there with us from the very beginning. Shout out to Chano and Kunprem for being amazing to work with. Uh, they'll both have booths at the upcoming event, so you can drop in and see what wares they've got available. <clears throat> and as we previously mentioned, AKA, um, you know, gym sponsor, they'll have some of their apparel, they'll have some of their guys down there just uh, letting people know about the programs they run. And another huge major sponsor that came on board this time, the Movan Pick Hotels. Uh, they've just opened a place on Succumbit Soy 15. It's a really nice place. They'll be providing rooms for our fighters and we'll be holding our press conferences, all of that there. You can check out the information on the event page on Facebook. And then Shark, the energy drink, also been with us from the beginning. They'll be there with their girls giving out some free energy, energy drinks and all of that. Singer will be supplying some alcohol, so there's a drink included for everybody that, that comes inside the door. So big shout out to Singer. And, of course, the venue themselves, Insanity, uh, a club Insanity on Succumbit Soy 12. And their sister pubs and all of that too, the Aussie Bar on Soy 12, which will be holding the weigh-ins there. And the Kiwi, which is a great place to go for a Sunday lunch. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I think without dragging on too much longer, mate, that's about it. Awesome, dude. Well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time. I can imagine that, uh, I mean, just knowing John, what sort of nutcase is. He is just running around uh, like a chicken with his head cut off trying to put everything because I know he's just got that vision and he, he wants to, you know, he wants to dot the I's and cross the T's. I'm sure uh, I'm sure you're caught up in that hurricane frenzy of insanity and uh, and you got a lot Indeed. to do in the next nine days. Indeed, mate. <laughs> and all I can say to everyone is please check out the event page. We'll be dropping lots of information in the days running up to the event about the press conference. We're also going to have a pool party on the Sunday following the event where you can meet the fighters, see who got the bonuses, meet the ring girls, have a good old shindig and let loose, all of that kind of jazz. So uh, just keep posted and uh, we'll be dropping more info as the days roll on. Yeah, just make sure whenever you make those social media posts, you know, just uh, include my name in them so that I, uh, I directly see them on and I'll make sure I blast those out through my Trash Talk MMA uh, outlets because I got a lot of followers in the area and uh, let's make sure that they all are aware of the goodness that's about to go down on August 22nd. Fantastic. Oh, one last thing, actually. Yep. Um the Modern Pig Hotels are offering a discount for anybody who wants to stay during fight week. 
and it's running up till the end of the month. And it's going for 2,500 baht a night. It's a four-star hotel that's usually over 3,500 baht a night. So if anyone's looking for a nice place to stay during that time, that's where we'll be. And uh, they're more than happy to accommodate any fans or anything at that discount rate. So I thought I'd plug that one as well, mate. <laughs> Perfect. That's what we're here for, man, just to promote the goodness. <laughs> All right. Awesome, Reed. Well, thank you for your time as well, man. It's uh, good to chat with you and catch up, even if it's not in person. And, uh, yeah, thanks for putting this out there and letting the people hear what's going down. Sounds good, dude. Listen, next time uh, we'll get we'll get you back on the show. I'll let you do your matchmaking for your Halloween event, and we'll get you back on here to do the same thing for that one. And uh, hopefully, we can we can take a little bit of time to also discuss uh, some of your music projects and whatnot. You know, we don't always have to just keep yeah. it MMA related. I know you uh, you make some sure. dope beats. Uh, you played me some last time uh, we hung out in Bangkok, and uh, it's uh, always good to throw that out there too. Anytime, anytime, mate. So, awesome, uh, Reef. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll catch up soon. And thanks thanks for the call and the podcast. Hey, man, it's my pleasure. Excellent. Right. Take Best, care. Okay. See you soon. Best of luck, Bye. man. This was the Trash Bye. Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelletier, with my guest, Ree Webster, the matchmaker for Full Metal Dojo. Make sure you tune into uh, Full Metal Dojo 6 on August 22nd if you're in the area in Bangkok. Make sure you follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We're out of here. Peace. I don't want to hear it. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter at Trash Talk MMA. Let us know you're listening. Use hashtag Trash Talk MMA. I, and I am the event organizer and matchmaker in the simplest terms. All right. Very cool. Um, you know, and just seeing how, you know, talking with John and seeing his passion that he, he puts into this promotion, it really sounds like, you know, that this is kind of like a mom and pop operation and it really comes down to a, a labor of love. And I'm sure the three of you really have, must have to have a lot in common and really align yourselves with John's vision to pull these things off. And I can imagine the amount of work is just horrifying. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's what kind of came naturally because the work is horrifying. The amount that we have put on our plate is, is ridiculous and anyone who kind of has worked with us will know that. We're pretty open book when it comes to you know the things, how we organize things and who we involve. So um, yeah, it's the fact that we do share John's vision and the things that he say we are fully like on board with most of the time. So it, it is that labor of love, that passion that just sort of everybody shares, which makes the abundance of work not too much of a nightmare to deal with, if that right. makes any sense. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, absolutely it does. I mean, you know, when you look at these big scale, you know, productions, you can only, I mean, you know, if you just look at something like a UFC or a Bellator or a, even a 1FC, I mean, you, you look at the scale and you imagine the moving parts, but you also imagine, you know, there, there's an incredible amount of staff behind all that. And, uh, you know, I know that I know yeah. that you guys just really get your hands dirty, right? <laughs> like, you know, you guys like make and break this thing. Yeah, we like to be involved in everything. I mean, but there isn't really a decision that happens in the company that doesn't come through us all together. You know, we're not out there just making decisions on our own. It is a real joint thing. With John, obviously, calling it the shots. I mean, he's the man who's been in the game the longest. He's the one with the respect, and he really knows the fighters out here in Southeast Asia, you know, more than more than bookies, more than fans, more more than people who train with somebody, because John wants to push MMA and combat sports throughout Asia. So there was a previous organization, which I'm sure people would be aware of, the Dare MMA, and we were actually all kind of part of that. Well, John was a major part of it. I helped out with a bit of the social media, a bit of their PR and stuff. And as they sort of... Hmm, how do you say this? As they sort of took a back seat on the events they were putting on, we decided to keep things going. So I've been uh, instrumental from the very beginning of Full Metal Dojo, and uh, all of us who are part of it now are actually had a background working with the Dare MMA guys before. So uh, we've all been doing MMA here in Bangkok for oh, a long time now, man. We're going on probably six years or something. Okay. okay. With FMD 
FMD founded about a year and a half ago. So uh, that's the basic background of how we all got started. Okay. Now, are you a practitioner of martial arts yourself? Actually, I'm not. I mean, I do train now, but I train now basically to get an idea of what these guys go through. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's funny you mention that. It's sort of what I, uh, why I got into <laughs> training a little bit of Muay Thai exactly. and MMA as well was to just, I'm a, just a super fan of the sport and um, to just, that's you know, it's easy to sit on your couch there and watch these guys beat the snot out of each other, but... An armchair fan and you, you're picking people's games apart and all of this. I, I didn't want to be just that guy, you know? So, uh, yeah, a fan of, of MMA for about 10, 15 years. Yeah, 12 years, ever since I moved out here, man. So, um, and then, yeah, as we started working with the previous organization and founding FMD, it was pretty important for me to uh, get up and out there and get socked in the face a couple of times. Um, I probably won't be fighting professionally, <laughs> but I'm always up for training. I'm always up for uh, learning the ins and outs of the games, like for real, you know, not just watching a few clips on TV. And Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado Antoine Pelche. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and today I have a very special guest, Ree Webster, the matchmaker from Full Metal Dojo, and Ree, we, <laughs> and Ree, pardon me, you have a, uh, you guys have a big card coming up on the 22nd, and I know you're instrumental to this organization. How are you doing, buddy? Yeah, I'm well. Thank you, Antoine. Hello, people out there. Thanks for your time. So yeah, next show, August 22nd, so uh, a week on Saturday, mate, and it's all going off at this end. Okay, excellent. So I had John on the show the other day. We kind of broke the news of the event coming out. I mean, it come. I think he broke the news a couple of days before, but one of the really cool yeah. processes that we're going to do uh, right here, right now, is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the employees and the people that make up Full Metal Dojo and also your uh, various roles within there and primarily your role as a, as a matchmaker within the organization. Cool, cool. So obviously John's the founder, the CEO, uh, and the all-around uh, multi-hat wearing uh, crazy dude yes. running around doing a gazillion things. And he's really the face of the organization. But, uh, you know, talking with him, it sounds like you play a really significant role in Full Metal Dojo as well. Have you have you been involved with every single one of the FMDs? Yeah, so basically what happened was, I mean, anybody who knows John will know he's the man with the vision. He's the man, you know, with these crazy ideas and really, really at every gym. He's not just training with the same people every day, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, it kind, yeah. it kind of goes like that. Very cool. Then look, man, let's not let's not uh, hesitate any further. Let's uh, let's announce this full fight card and let's step through each match and let people know. Let's let's hear your process. You know, let's step through um, let's step through your fighters, see why you pick them, why you put them together, and what you're expecting from these matchups. Cool. All right. So I'm, I'm gonna shoot in no particular order. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and I'm going to start off with, I don't know if we're even going to call this our headline bout, but it's certainly one of our most prominent. We've got two Thai guys. They're widely known as some of the best MMA guys in Thailand. They both fought for us a couple of times, as well as fighting many times in the other lower-level amateur organizations throughout Thailand. And uh, we're basically, we're going to hold a, a bantamweight championship with this bout. So we're actually going to award one of them, the, the bantamweight champion of FMD. And uh, with John's crazy vision, we're not handing out belts or medals. We're giving them a katana. We're giving them a sword. <laughs> yeah, he announced <laughs> so, that on the podcast we did. I think it's an awesome idea, man. There we go. That's John for you. So these guys are, first guys, uh, Dechidin, Petsinkorn, and I am not even going to pronounce that second name. Sorn Sivi Patanin, something like that. The guys out there, everyone will know him as Dechidin Petsinkorn. Okay. Now, he's a Muay Chai practitioner who's moved into MMA. Um, and he will be fighting a guy called Kripsadar Krongsi Chai, otherwise known as Dream Man. 
Um, Dream Man's on the Thai nas national wrestling team based in Chumphon. He's actually doing his, um, his fight camp up here in Bangkok for this next show. So, um, Dechidin's holding a record of 2-2 two and two as a pro and 4-1 and one as an amateur with uh, thinking you know everything. So Totally. So... Obviously, we're going to talk about your role as the matchmaker within the company, but, you know, we, we talked a little bit before and uh, before we hit record here, and um, you were explaining that there's really just three people running FMD. So who besides you and John is involved, and how do you guys separate your roles within the organization? Okay, well, I'm sure you can imagine staff, it was a bit difficult to separate roles. The other guy that we have as a founding member, his name's Richard Arthur, he's known in Bangkok for writing a a traveler's book, a book about his tales of backpacking years and years ago. And uh, he's also a, a long fan of MMA and, you know, has been into the sport ever since and was working with the previous organization. So it was us three who decided to get things rocking under the Full Metal Dojo brand. And between us three, I mean, we employ people, we hire people to help us out. But it really is just us three. And we've got Richard basically dealing with the business side of things, hitting up the sponsors and, you know, doing all the, the organizational work, all the schedules, all the logistics, all that kind of stuff. Um, I personally, myself, come from an event background. I've been a music producer, been in bands, a DJ, all of that kind of stuff. So um, I tend to take care of a lot of the event planning as well. <clears throat> And then John is obviously, as we spoke before, he's just the man with the vision, the man who gets out there, meets the people, and, and you know, he puts his ideas out there. We figure out whether they're going to be good for the people, and then we put them into practice. So under John, there's me and Rich trying to get things rocking, and jobs sort of, you know, change between events. Sometimes one person's taking care of this, sometimes another person's taking care of that. Um, but I would say that, if you had to just put a, a title on our job, job descriptions, Richard is the business guy.